hey, that was interesting. We should try that again. Didn't work the second time, never does. We're glad that you're here uh, to worship Sycamore Hills Baptist Church. Thanks for coming out this morning on a great uh, fall day. I got a little echo up here, Eli. We can gain that up or down or whatever you got to do. Anyway, we're glad that you're here. Lots going on this coming week. Be in prayer next Sunday afternoon, 3.30, trunk or treat. Kevin's going to put our signs up tomorrow afternoon, so they'll be advertised going up and down 39th Street. And we still have room for folks who would just like to hand out candy. We've got our story set pretty well nailed down, and the folks that are going to do that are practicing, or at least you better be, and be ready to tell those stories. Um, we've got some pre-registration going on. If you want to get online and do pre-registration, please do that. Save you a little time. When you get here, you'll get all of your children will get their uh, storybook passport. Those have all been created and printed. Uh, and they're ready to go, and so you, we'll give that to every kid that gets registered. They'll get a stamp. The stamps came in, so we can stamp that they've heard all the stories. When they've heard all the stories, they can turn, show that. We kind of want them to take it home, because I have the Roman Road to Salvation on the back of it, <clears throat> and uh, we'll give them an extra prize, and when they register, they also get tickets for hot dogs, and so lots going on. I think our plan for next uh, Sunday was, for those of us that are going to be really, really intimately involved, um, we were going to have some pizza in the fellowship hall back there in the gym and then get it set up. It's going to be a pretty big adventure. We're going to need all hands on deck. So if you, even if you haven't signed up, you want to come and help in any way, just point people in the right direction. Come and help and be a part of next Sunday afternoon. I think it'd be a great, great opportunity. But Anyway, lots, lots going on. Appreciate the ladies meeting yesterday to pray, and uh, we can't bathe it in prayer enough. And so, just continue to pray as we as we move through the week. So, we're glad you're here. Let's pray so we can really get into worship here. Father, we thank you for the opportunities that you have laid before us. We pray, Father, that we will be prepared and you will bring out scads of folks and that we can have an opportunity to share the gospel and to make the claims of Christ and at least tell the stories of what your son has done for all who would believe. Father, we thank you for gathering us in this place this morning to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, I would ask that... Uh, you might attend to each one uh, at their point of need because we've all entered this room with a variety of issues and concerns. Father, meet us at those issues and concerns. Give us grace to go through it, around it, over it, or remove it from us, Father. But we look forward expectantly to what you'll do with us in the days ahead. And uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to gather in this place and worship and you in spirit and truth. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Let's give glory to the King. Let's stand together as we sing together. chapter 9 starts with some really, really bad news. So just brace yourselves. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar of the temple and he said, strike the capitals until the thresholds shake. Shatter them on the heads of all the people. All those who are left of them I will kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. If they dig into Sheol, from there shall my hand take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, from there I will search them out and take them. And if they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. And if they go into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell in it mourn, and all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt, who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vaults upon the earth, 
who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are you not like the Cushites to me, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Syrians from Kir? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble shall fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say, Disaster shall not overtake or meet us. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. You may be seated as we pray. Father, we've sung this morning, not to us, but to your name be the glory. And Father, we find in these words that very sentiment. Lord, we see that you are a God who is righteous and you will judge sin. You do not take it lightly. You are the great and holy and righteous God and sin is a deep offense against you. Father, we acknowledge your holiness today. We acknowledge your righteousness we acknowledge your justice. We acknowledge your faithfulness. Father, we do not come today kidding ourselves that you are some great granddad in the sky who just kind of sits aloof and, and doesn't care about what happens in the world and doesn't care about holiness among your people. You are intimately acquainted and involved with everything. And you are a God who does indeed judge sin. And there is a great day coming when you will judge it fully and finally. But Father, it's because you have already dealt with it decisively in the cross of Jesus. How can we, as an unrighteous people, gather here today? It's because what you have done for us in Jesus. When we were far from you, he came and brought us near through his life and through his death and through his resurrection. And we who have repented and believed and hoped in you find life in Jesus today. And we no longer stand condemned under your judgment. Indeed, your judgment was poured out upon him for us. We stand here today as a righteous people not because of a righteousness that we have earned or achieved, but a righteousness that has been granted to us through Jesus. Father, we thank you for that today. We give you praise and we give you glory as the great redeeming one. And Father, even now, you are calling people unto yourself. Father, we pray that if there are people in this room today who do not know you, that you would open their eyes to this truth. If there are people today who are under the illusion that they know you but do not, would you open their eyes to their waywardness and would you grant them repentance and faith today so that we may rejoice together in you, the God of our salvation, who judges but who also restores. And Father, we ask that you would restore us today 
We ask that even as you gather in the nations, we were among those who were lost and far from you. We are those who are among the nations. We ask that just as you have gathered us in, that you would gather many others in. And Father, we, we long for and wait for the day when all of your promises will be full and final, when you create a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. When these promises that you have spoken to your people, promises that you have fulfilled in Jesus, would be made plain to our sight in a land that is rich and flourishing and thriving, not just with produce of the field, but, Lord, with people who produce a righteousness that brings glory to you. Would you manifest that even now in our midst today? Would you make us a people who produce righteousness? Father, it is your power in us that will do that. So would you make us yielded to you today? Would your spirit work in us that which is beautiful and good and pleasing in your sight? And may you receive the glory for all of it. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Let's sing together. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold I 
Brother Jim. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us today as you are every day. Be with this church as it continues to grow and bless these gifts and the givers. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. As we prepare for the preaching of the word this morning, hymn number 122 will help us to do that. As, remind, as we remind ourselves that no matter where we are in the Bible, ultimately it is the story of Jesus. All right, so let's sing together hymn number 122.
fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past, how for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender Turn with me to Acts chapter 15 as we work our way through the book of Acts kind of at a high level. <clears throat> I've driven around the metro 20 years, 25 years now, driven around various parts of the country as have many of you. Have you noticed that speed limits don't make better drivers? <laughs> Ever noticed that? Speed limits don't make better drivers. In fact, sometimes I think they make worse drivers because they set a barrier by which now you can sin against and go over that speed limit. I remember Becky and I were taking the girls on a vacation one year, and I mentioned about getting a radar detector for my car to a good Christian brother. And he looked at me and he said, so you're planning on sinning? on the way on your vacation, huh, Scott? And I said, well, I'm not planning on it. But sometimes when the girls are watching movies and I'm up there as a chauffeur all by myself, sometimes I get a little heavy-footed. And it would be nice to have a little bit of warning. I'm not doing it on purpose. Speed limits don't make better drivers. Uh, as a young driver, many of you I'm sure would fit into this category. As a young driver, you certainly tried to obey some of the speed limits because you didn't want to you didn't want to pay the penalty. Do you get caught driving a little too quick? It was money out of your pocket and hey, it could be that old dear old dad would take the car keys away from you and hang them up. Um, when we disobey the speed limit, it's because we think we're not going to get caught. Isn't that right? I mean, if you're, and if you're really hot-footing it down the highway, you really are betting on the fact that you are not going to get caught. Um, the reason we ought to obey the speed limit is because we value one another on the, on the roads. I don't want to be in such a motion of hurry out there on the highway that now I create a problem not only for myself but for other folks that may be out there. 
We do that out of love for one another. We do that out of care for one another. That ought to be the way that Christians, as we go down the road, we look at this. And listen, I've been in debates with Christians before about obeying the speed limit, and they did not believe that they were lawbreakers because they just broke the speed limit. It's just the speed limit. You are a lawbreaker if you have violated that speed limit. Now, where does all of this, why, how does this all tie in? Well, listen, you can't make a bunch of rules by which people are going to get saved and hold them to those rules, except the rule be that you have believed in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, his burial, resurrection, ascension, and return. If you want to make that a rule, I guess, but you can't make a bunch of rules by which people are going to get saved. We wish we could, don't we? Don't we wish there was just like three things, you know, hey, you know, Richard, get down and give me 50 push-ups and you're in, right? We could make rules like that, okay? But, and that's, people have tried to do that throughout the years. And it is just faith in Jesus Christ. You can't add, what are they going to do here in Acts 15? They're going to try to add circumcision in order to be saved, that they must be circumcised. And if you have noticed that usually the Judaizers, the Pharisees, that crew, they always go to Moses and the law. Moses and the law. Circumcision and the law. And they all go to that. And where does Paul always go? And even Peter to some extent. Where do they go? They go to Abraham. They go over Moses and they go to Abraham who it was credited to him as righteousness because he believed God and then he got the rule, if you will, of circumcision. Now we give the Judaizers a hard time, but can you fathom all they've ever known in their entire life was that one rule? They, I mean a bunch of others, but they had to have that circumcision followed and then a bunch of, you know, Knuckleheads like us show up and think, hey, you ain't got to do all that. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed as white as snow. And imagine how you would feel. So they struggled with that. Those people that were deeply into Judaism, they, they struggled with that. They were told, I mean, you remember when Moses forgets to circumcise his own son and, I mean, it's going to be a disaster of biblical proportions. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a mess, and his wife has to do it. It was serious stuff. He didn't mess around with that. It was a sign that they were in the covenant. It was a sign that they had believed in the Lord, although many of them wandered around in the desert for 40 years having disobeyed the Lord and not believed the Lord, and then they died in the desert. So as we look at... Acts 15 today, we want to make sure we think about next week. I don't know what I'll talk about after we get done next week. We'll come up with something, another ministry to launch off or something. As, as we think about these dear folks in this neighborhood coming onto the campus and, and us interacting with them and telling Bible stories, you and I cannot tie up a burden on them that is not Jesus and Jesus alone. We can't do it. As you've heard me laugh before, please don't make them Baptists first. If you make them Baptists first, they think they have to live like this. Don't make them Baptists. Let's see them get saved and we'll teach them to observe all that he has Commanded. So that's our goal and our purpose as we look at this today. And yet, I would say the problem that we have seen across the land in the churches, especially our evangelical churches, is we don't tie up any burden on anybody. Oh, if they'll just walk an aisle and pray a prayer. You know, so many churches have turned that into evangelism. Get them to walk an aisle. And then discipleship consists of coaxing them into the water to be baptized. 
and then they, we think we're, we're done. And churches across the land have not tied up any burden. Listen, there is a burden that you and I have, having come to faith in Christ, and that is to live as Christians in the world, to live winsome and gracious and kind and, and strong, fearless, to live fearless out here in the world, fearless unto the Lord, not fearless in a stupid way, but fearless unto the Lord that it doesn't matter what the world's doing. We're going to do what God has called us to do. They show up on next Sunday afternoon and tell us, you can't do that gospel thing. Well, I guess a bunch of us will go to jail next Sunday night. We're just going to do it. I think I teased with you as your interim pastor. I'm not going to jail alone. Some of y'all are going with me. We're going to jail. And, and we chuckle about it, but different parts of the world, different parts of the world, they do go to jail. Acts 15, it's a lengthy read. I'll let you just give attention there where you're seated. Let me read through this, and then we're going to look at really two insights into how we ought to live so that we don't tie up burdens on people that are too heavy to bear, and yet we tie up the right burdens so that they do understand. They were bought with a price. Now glorify God with your body, Paul tells the Corinthian church. And some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. When Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. And when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Now you notice there, that was Pharisees who had believed. It's a struggle. Put down some of your stuff. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days, of, uh, in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test? By placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. And the multitude kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done among them, through them among the Gentiles. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, after these days I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch and with Paul and Barnabas, 
Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren, and they sent them sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words unsettling your souls, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from these things, you will do well. Farewell. So then they sent away... So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. And after they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas was desirous of taking John, called Mark, along with them. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had departed them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. After the after and there arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, uh, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia strengthening the churches. Father, we ask your blessing upon the reading of your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Things get messy on the mission field. For those of us that have ever been on the mission field, things get messy. Things happen. It's not America. It's not the way we're used to doing uh, business. It's, It's stuff happens. Cultural things come boiling up to the top. For our people group that were in Kenya, the gospel had been through there before, but there was a gentleman who had taken the gospel there, and he believed that if you said you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that all of your cultural stuff was just fixed, was all fixed. Now you have a culture that we were a part of there that has multiple wives. Men have multiple wives. Now, they're monogamous with one at a time, as far as I could tell. But they have a wife, they start a family, they all live in stick huts. Children get bigger. The man leaves that wife behind with those children and takes a second wife and has family with them. Still supports the children over here as best we could tell, but he's no longer in a relationship really with that wife. So he's not doing the Mormon thing. He's not... It's one at a time. But what do you do with that? It's messy. It doesn't, it doesn't fit into my little American cookbook of how church planning ought to go and how people ought to respond to the gospel. You've got to deal with that. It's messy. What do you do? Well, you're not going to tell Bob over here who has three wives to send two of them off to the bush like Hagar. Can't do that. He's responsible for those kids. What are you going to do? How are you going to eliminate that next generation? It's messy stuff. Sometimes you have to sit and have meetings. And that's what happens here. We got these folks who show up, the Judaizers. They they show up. Men from Judea came down teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved according to the law of Moses. For us as We move forward as a church, as evangelists. 
on mission to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ, we have to understand there is a difference between necessary boundaries or guardrails that we may set up to assist our sanctification than there are having external rules and regulations in order to be saved. So let me say that a little simpler. <laughs> we can set rules and boundaries for ethical behavior how we ought to interact with one another, how we ought to live amongst one another, how we ought to engage one another, how we ought to be living. We can set some boundaries to keep us from doing certain things. Nothing wrong with setting those boundaries. Absolutely nothing wrong with setting those boundaries. But you can't make rules for how people are going to get saved. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And guess what? God will have to sort all of that out in the end. We do our due diligence to assist people and to teach people and to bring people in. But we're not laying a bunch of rules that you have to do this, such, and the other thing in order to be saved, short of belief in Jesus Christ. There are no external rules or regulations or law by which we can keep them externally where we can definitively say that a person is saved because they did X, Y, and Z. And why is that? Because anybody can do X, Y, and Z. They could have all been circumcised. Now, as an adult, that begins to become an issue, which is one of the reasons I believe there were a lot of God-fearers that didn't convert completely over to Judaism in the temple. But you can't create a bunch of rules because anybody can keep the rules. Anybody can do some of that stuff. I mean, anybody can. The keeping of the law, then, so you kept the rules. Okay, so let's make a rule. You must walk an aisle in order to be saved. You think, oh, well, nobody would believe that flipping. No, no, no. <laughs> I've been challenged before as I was ready to baptize people that uh, they didn't walk an aisle. Like, where was that? And I missed that chapter in the Bible. Not to walk an aisle in order to be saved. We can present people right there in that baptistry, first time, right there. No big deal. The law... And keeping that law has no ability to change a heart. That's why the whole speed limit thing, until people's hearts are changed, until we see that we ought to, out of love for one another, out of love for our own family that's in the vehicle with us, out of my love for Tony this afternoon, we'll pay attention on the highway as we go down to St. Charles. We'll, we'll mind our manners. But just because we minded our manners doesn't mean that we were saved. We're saved because we love one another and we care for one another. and We want to love uh, the world out here. But yet, you see as they come down through here, as they meet, as Peter gets up to speak, and then James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, uh, James and John. James has already been executed, the original disciple James. This is James, the brother of Jesus. As they begin to speak, they understand like we can't add that to a bunch of these Gentiles, but there are some things those Gentiles ought to be doing. There, are, there is a way in which they ought to be living. They ought to abstain from fornication, which is largely pointing toward temple prostitution. But guess what? It fits all of that stuff for us. We don't have that specific, but... Fornication is a very wide, broad thing that you and I got to be paying attention to. We don't live like the rest of the world out here. Strangling. Shouldn't eat anything that's strangled. What has that got to do with? Well, the best anybody can tell is that that was probably part of the sacrificial system that went on in the Gentile temples, and that was the way in which they killed their sacrifices. They would strangle them. So what, is, what are the apostles telling? What is James and Peter, what are they agreeing to here? That there is a difference now that you have come to faith in Christ and you just don't live like the rest of the world lives out there. And there's some things that you ought not be taking part in because it is not healthy 
for your walk with the Lord to be a part of that kind of stuff. You and I actually have to apply the thou shalt not to what does it look like here in the world today. Have no graven images. Dealing with idolatry. Well, they're dealing with idolatry here. The Gentiles had their idols. And they were paying attention to them. And they worshipped them. And they had temples for the worship of those idols. And they're telling them here, listen, you can't participate in that stuff anymore. You can't be a part of that. So now in your own life, as you live your life out here, there are some things that we ought not be a part of. We need to leave that behind. One of the easy, you know, checks that you can make in your life is you get ready to go do something. You can ask yourself, how does this help my walk with Jesus? How does this enhance my walk with the Lord? And if the answer is it doesn't, well, now you got some decisions to make. Is it just adiaphora? Is it just nobody cares or is does it take you away from Jesus and that's the real issue you get ready to do something and participate in something and be a part of something does it line up with scripture at all and if you can't tell does it help my walk with Jesus am I going to be closer to Jesus at the end of this event than when I started or is it going to enable my shame and guilt of my life to come back to the forefront for the failings that we've had. And if it's going to enable the guilt and shame, don't you wish you could feel the guilt and the shame right before you actually did the sin? I've told the Lord that a thousand times probably. Lord, I wish I could just feel how awful I feel after I've said that thing or done that thing or acted that way. I wish I could just feel that like 30 seconds before I was going to open my mouth and put my foot in it. Wish I could just feel that. And then I could step away. They're going to set boundaries for those Gentiles. They're going to set boundaries for those Gentiles so that those Gentile Christians who have come to faith in Jesus Christ look differently, act differently, and think differently than those Gentiles that are going to be in Antioch. They're going to, they're going to be different. And it is okay to set boundaries out here for sanctification. Now, once again, you can't make rules for sanctification. Because once again... I was, an, I was the guy who could, you know, if you told me what I had to do to get an A in class, I could figure out how to get that A. I could do the minimum daily requirement to get that A. You know, if the teacher told me I could get a 90, I'm not going to shoot for 100. Our goal is not as we walk with the Lord, our, our goal is... As we have come to faith in Christ, our goal is not the minimum daily requirement for being a Christian. When you get out of bed, do you say, hey, what's the minimum daily requirement that I could do today in order to maintain my walk with the Lord? Listen, if you're living in that, and of course nobody's consciously doing that, but if we're honest, some days when we get up out of bed, it's like, oh, this is going to be a pretty tough day. I hope I can just, you know, skate through somehow. As you come to faith in Christ, we're asking what the maximum daily effort really looks like. Hey, Lord, give me an opportunity for the maximum daily effort. And I've got boundaries out here, and I'm going to do my best not to cross those boundaries. And when I do, I'm going to repent and confess those, and I'm going to get back in line with you. As they come here... The Judaizers have come, the Pharisees have come, and they believe that, uh, and some of them, it says they believed, but they thought they had to do a bunch of other stuff, primarily this circumcision. Here's the key as we set boundaries in our own life for things that you think you need to set a boundary on to enable you to walk a better walk, a closer walk with the Lord. You can't hold everybody accountable to your set of boundaries all the time. Our brother Don Whitney never watches football on Sunday. 
He never watches football on Sunday. You know why? Because Sunday's the Lord's day. And he believes that he ought to spend his entire day with his family, worshiping the Lord, having meals together, singing. It's kind of an all-day experience from what I remember Dr. Whitney talking about it at seminary class. But he never once looked down his nose at those of us who, as soon as church was over, we crank on the Chiefs game to see where the Chiefs are. That was the boundary that he had set in his own life. Now, if we had lived the way Don Whitney had wanted us to live, would we probably be better Christians? Hard to say, isn't it? That's where it's messy. That's where it's messy. That's why Dr. Whitney would suggest that we all do that. But then you have to meet with the Lord and you have to decide that, how you will play that out in your own life. You can make those rules um, and set boundaries. I'm, I'm calling them boundaries. Maybe the better way to say it is we're going to set expectations. I think there's really two levels of these boundaries that you can set. One of them is they are directly related to the thou shalt nots of the scripture. It's easy to set those boundaries. You need to interpret those boundaries for your children. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. You need to set those boundaries. Maybe you have to tell, you know, little brother to stay out of big sister's room because he's taking her stuff. You got to set some of those boundaries out there. Um, that are directly related to what God has said, you will not do, you should not do, this is not right. And then there's other boundaries that help you not violate those boundaries. And it's, if you're not careful, you'll become a Pharisee in this because you'll just pile up law upon law upon law upon law and then you will teach as traditions of men as if they were what God had ordained for us to do. It's a scary thing even to stand here right now and talk about that kind of liberty because we're not used to having that kind of liberty in our lives as we walk with the Lord. You see here where uh, Peter stands up and he makes clear that he had an opportunity to go to the Gentiles. He's going to refer back to Cornelius. And they have received the gospel exactly the same way, in exactly the same circumstances that it happened when Pentecost happened and the Holy Spirit fell on those disciples. It has happened exactly the same way. Which leads to our second insight is there is a symphony of agreement with the Old Testament prophets and their declaration of the promised Messiah. But also there is a symphony of the Old Testament prophets as uh, they testify that the Gentiles will come into uh, the family of God and be known as the people of God. Now I said symphony there. When, the, uh, when Peter says, in, or James says in verse 15, and with the words uh, of the prophets agree, just as it is written. That word agree is the word for symphony. Nice general terms, it's the word for symphony. So the prophets of old, and Tony read Amos. Amos is referenced here. Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Jeremiah uh, 12, verse 15 is referenced. There's a reference to Isaiah 45, 21 in this quote that James gives. And they are now seeing that that prophecy of God bringing the Gentiles in to be his people is actually being fulfilled right now in that moment. He's actually doing it. He's actually at work. There is a symphony. You have uh, Zechariah 2.11 says, Many nations will join themselves to the Lord and will be, uh, become my people. Isaiah 2.2 2 says, Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain uh, of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and call the nations and all the nations will stream to it. So this is not just a specific Amos reference here. James calls out those that verse, uh, primarily Amos 9, 12, that he calls out, but he says the prophets. And there is an agreement across the board of the prophets. These, uh, 
prophetic voices all the way back to Moses, written some 1,000, 1,500 years, depending on when you date Moses, 1,500 years of writing, and this stuff all lays out and agrees. This book is tight, folks. This book is tight. There's not any holes in this book. You're not going to fall through the cracks if you stay with this book. If you read this book and love this book and obey this book, the disciples recognized that right then, right at that moment, right in front of their eyes, the Lord God was fulfilling the prophecy of including the Gentile in as his people. This is a new work of God. This is not a bunch of proselytes coming over to become Jewish and then become Christians, which is what it appears they wanted them to do or become a Christian. Then you have to do all the Jewish thing. This is a complete new work. This is a work not been done before on planet earth in mass. Been done as uh, the Lord God would go and as he called Abraham and others. You can see that it was by faith that they believed. But now he's doing it for all who will believe. It's a, this book is tight. It holds together. Read the Old Testament, it points to Jesus. Read the New Testament, it tells you all about Jesus and what he has done and everything you need to know right now to walk with him. And then it tells you that he's coming back and he's, he's returning. How tight are you with this book? With the central message, the meta narrative over this book, how tight are you with this? Well, I'm telling you, you better get tight with it. You better get in it and you better know it. Did you read that in Australia there was a guy who was nominated or elected to be the president of one of their Australian rules football teams? He was just going to be the president of the team. He's just going to run the organization, um, you know, much like maybe, I don't know, is it Veach, the general manager for the Chiefs, he had a position with the Australian rules football team. Well, guess what? He was on the board of an evangelical church in Australia. Guess what? They canceled him, lost his job. You know why? Because in the evangelical church, even in Australia, they speak against sin. And they name the sin that God names in the scripture still as sin. And when you start naming those sins out according to the scripture, the world doesn't like that anymore because you've called them into account. And they canceled him. You think, oh man, I'm so glad that's all the way down there in Australia. Well, don't hold your breath. It may be coming to a company near you one day. What will you do? I mean, is this book so tight with you and your salvation and your walk with the Lord and your understanding of the goodness of God and the grace of God and the provision of God and the answer to prayer that God gives that if they show up at Granger on Monday and they say, hey, you know, Ben Bush, he's over there and I heard that preacher say something about sin and we got a bunch of those people that work here in this building and I'm sorry, Ben, you have to find another job. If you think that can't happen in America, well, you need to come home from the rabbit hole with Alice in the Wonderland because it'll happen. Don't think that we're such a superior people in our civil walk with one another that they won't, if they get control of that situation, they'll fire all of us out there. Now, it's probably not going to happen tomorrow, but it is happening in parts of the world. And this book has got your salvation, the plan of salvation in it. It's got the fact that the God of the universe loved you so much that He sent His own Son to die on the cross for you. And the Son did it willingly and gladly, not begrudgingly. He did it. He gave His life up on the cross of Calvary. You have to believe in Him. That's all you got to do. You have to believe. Now once you believe, that belief is going to change your affections. So that you want the things of God. If His Spirit resides in you, will His Spirit not burden you with the things of God and the ways of God and the will of God and the Word of God? Will He not do that? Absolutely, that's what He does. 
One of the ways, I, I read an article not too long ago about how you're going to know at the end of someone's life if they're still a Christian. If, they're still, if they ever actually were a Christian, how will you know? Well, I think there's two ways in which you will know at the end of a person's life if they're a Christian. Number one, are they still praying? Are they still praying? Praying's a sign you're a Christian. Because you know, now listen, I know there's all kinds of people offering prayers to the God, up, to the big man upstairs. Okay, we're not talking about that. We're talking about you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. You believe Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried, raised from the dead, and he's coming back. And you're asking him for help on a daily basis. Yeah, you're one of his. You're one of his. Are you still worshiping? Are you still worshiping at the end of your life? Whatever that looks like, maybe in your deathbed, are you still worshiping? Is there a glimmer of, in your eye that you're about to meet Jesus? My hope is if you're there with me, I'm just going to look at you and say, I'm going to get to see him first. I'm going to beat you there. I'm going to get to see him first. Because I believed. Because you believed. Not because you did 50 push-ups. Not because you went on 17 mission trips. Or not because you taught Sunday school for 100 years. Or you worked trunk or treat next Sunday with us. Those ought to be results of your salvation. Not in order to achieve it. Ought to be results. I mean, you go back and read the book of James. <laughs> you don't have a pile of works beside you when you wheel up to meet Jesus face to face. And they're like, look, Lord, that's, I did that just for you. I just surrendered and then, oh, wait, I didn't even do that for you. You did that through me. How about that? Man, there is a symphony. This book hangs together. This book is tight. The Old Testament prophets... All agreed. And they longed. What does Peter say? They longed. They longed to see the Messiah to come. Couldn't wait to see him. And we live on the right side of Calvary, I would say, because we know his name. His name is Jesus. You can set boundaries. You can set boundaries. Set boundaries in your own family. We can set boundaries as a church on things that we will participate in and things that we were not participate in. You know what, Midwestern, when I was there in the late 90s and the boats came in and the casinos came in, the trustees passed a rule that Midwestern Seminary would not receive winnings from the lottery that had been implemented along with the boats. We would not receive winnings. Wouldn't do it. People will say, well, the devil's had all that money for all those times. Why didn't... It's like, well, we're still going to depend upon the Lord to do what He does. And only He does. So you can set rules. You just can't set rules to get people saved. Because if we did, all of our children would be lockstep in line with the Lord Jesus. And all we can do is love them and care for them and uh, tend to them. Be ready. Be tight. This, your salvation is more important than your job. Salvation is more important than uh, inflation. Your salvation is more important than the November election coming up in a couple of weeks. Your salvation is the thing, the most treasured possession in your existence. Because you believed in Jesus Christ. Not because you jumped through 12 hoops that the church wanted you to jump through. In order to be saved. So if you're here this morning and you're keeping track of the work you do in order to please God and maybe achieve your own salvation, uh, you're in the wrong line. Is there uh, something you're doing or need to do or think about doing in order to secure your salvation? When you see Jesus face to face on that day, when you meet him face to face, having departed planet Earth through the event called death or rapture, uh, Will you be sure to whip out a piece of paper and show Jesus all of the check marks on it that all the things you achieved in order that he can receive you into his rest? If you're doing that, you're not going into his rest. You simply have to receive salvation through faith by the grace of God. 
By believing in Jesus Christ. And if you believe that Jesus came in the flesh, that is of God. You don't want to be in the I'm earning my way into heaven line. Today, enter his rest. Quit your striving to earn your salvation. Receive your salvation by faith, by believing in Jesus and all that he has done for you. And then strive, and then, listen, and then strive with joy to serve the Lord and please the Lord. Christian, are you building your faith day by day, strengthening your faith with the work of love and service to the Lord Jesus? Accept no other alternatives. Accept no other burdens that would be laid on another person except repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. You know, as we have our children out there, uh, maybe as a church we ought to take example from our own preschool. Now think about as we deal with people, and this was the problem that the evangelist had in Kenya when he took the gospel up through the people group, he couldn't figure out how to get those baby Christians to super maturity in one fail swoop. And that was what he wanted. Why does he want that? Because that's easier. <laughs> if they all go from infant Christians to super mature Christians at the same time, you don't have very many problems that you have to deal with. And like in our preschool, we don't get mad. Our teachers don't get mad when those children mispronounce a word. They're learning to talk. They're learning. Nobody gets mad when they color outside of the lines. Guess what? When baby Christians come into the church, they're going to color outside of the lines. And you know what you need to do? If they made an honest effort at coloring, you need to do just what you do with your own children. Oh, that's the best thing I've ever seen. Now, we're metaphorically speaking here. You understand that. But that's the way we have to look at this thing. They got to grow up. Some of us are still Toys R Us kids. And we haven't quite grown up yet. We need to, we need to move to maturity. This place ought to look like our families, shouldn't it? Great grandma, great grandpa, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, aunts, uncles teenagers, toddlers, children, infants, everybody's all in one family and everybody's all on different levels and everybody's moving hopefully in the same direction of the family but at different speeds and different rates. And that's the way the church has got to look. We have to teach people to observe all that he has commanded. You have to teach them to observe. We're not just teaching them what he commanded. We're teaching them to observe what he commanded, which means you have to be observing what he commanded to teach them to observe what he commanded. You have to be doing it. And you're going to teach baby Christians on one level and maturing Christians on another and advancing Christians on another. And it's, that's why the teaching ministry is so critical in the church. Because it's all different levels. Even though you would think chronology would have a big vote, <laughs> chronology, your length of time on planet Earth always doesn't add up sometimes. We're all on different places. So as they came here, they sent um, them back. They thought, well, we can't just send Paul and Barnabas back. Because Paul and Barnabas were already on the no circumcised camp. So if we just sent Paul and Barnabas back and said, yep, they said it in Jerusalem, no circumcision. So they send Silas and Judas, or Sabbath, with them to verify that that actually was the message that was delivered by the elders and apostles, disciples at Jerusalem, that they would lay no other burden on them for the law of Moses, but that they ought to do those things of... Uh, Idolatry, you got to stay away from it. You got to stay away from the thing strangled, uh, which they believe is the sacrifice in the temple. Also, the blood, they think that probably the priest in the pagan temples, when they sacrificed, actually tasted the blood. And they're like, you just can't participate in that stuff anymore. They set boundaries. 
and they saw that God was actually doing the inclusion of the Gentiles right there in their midst. Now that's cool. When you see him actually bring people in, in droves. Let's pray that we all see that in the days ahead, Sycamore Hills. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to look at your word, be challenged by it. Father, we all need rules and regulations and boundaries and help because our flesh is weak and our flesh wants what it wants when it wants it. So Father, help us to set joyful, loving guardrails for sanctification that help us walk with you and let us never make a rule beyond it's Jesus and him crucified. The Pharisees were testing God because they just couldn't fathom that belief in Jesus was enough. But belief in Jesus is enough. Father, help us to walk that walk. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is In Christ Alone. One of the all-time great new hymns that we sing. I would invite you to stand and sing that. If you're looking for a church home, we would encourage you to come and place your ministry here at Sycamore Hills Baptist Church. And we'll figure out what your gifts are and where you best fit in. And we will have opportunities for you to serve joyfully uh, as a result of your salvation. If you haven't received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the question I always ask is, what else do you want him to do? What else would you want Jesus to do that he didn't did? He surrendered his life on the cross of Calvary. He died to pay the penalty of your sin. What else? He's done. He's done what you have to have done. He's done that. Um, if you haven't received Jesus, we offer you freely that time to come now and receive him in the most joyful place you'll ever do it, in his church. Let's stand and sing. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final the
the power of Christ I'll stand. I ask you all to be seated for just a moment as Don comes. Good morning. Good morning. As you know, it's October, and October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So if I could have Scott and Becky and Tony and Ruth Ann and Trevor and Haley, if they can hear me back in the cry room. <laughs> Come on down, if you would, please. Uh, during the past 12 months, um, the following has happened. Our pastor retired. A search committee was activated. An interim was hired. We went from a COVID situation to a hopefully past COVID situation. We've seen new additions to our congregation. And we've reached out to our community and next Sunday is a, an example of that. These folks right here have led that during the last 12 months. I was thinking before I come up here, this is the first time in 28 years and the times that I've been up here doing this, that Brother Willie's not here, but you know what? The ministry still goes on. And these individuals are the ones that are help to, helping us to lead us through that transition time. I think it might be appropriate if we gave them a thank you round of applause. Is that okay? So on behalf of the Sycamore Hills Baptist Church congregation and the Sycamore Hills Personnel Committee, we would like to thank you all for your leadership, for your service, and for your ministry to this congregation. Thank you so much, ladies. If you come on up, we've got some flowers. <clears throat> I don't necessarily want to deflect or, or defer. Uh, there are people behind the scenes that you don't know of that are part of the glue that God uses to hold this place together by the working of his spirit. And I don't want that to go unsaid or unnoticed. I'm not going to embarrass people today. You, you probably know who you are. I think the folks in the congregation probably know who you are. Thank you for laboring faithfully uh, in the Lord's work with us. And uh, this is a family, and we are on mission together. So thank you for that. As you go today, uh, Scott made mention, next Sunday, trunk or treat, there will be pizza, salad after service for those who are going to be working. Need a good handful of you probably just to be here for that, to kind of set up an area for some food, uh, as we might just have a place for some families if they need to sit down at a table or something to enjoy that food, to do that. So just come, chip in, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a place to work, okay? Um, as, you, as you go today, uh, come back tonight. Uh, two of our, our dear saints will be leading service tonight. You know that Scott and I are going to be heading to St. Charles for the annual meeting. Uh, Brother Don is going to be opening God's word tonight for us. Uh, Trevor is going to be limping along as he leads worship, he and Haley. <laughs> No bearing on your leadership, though, brother. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's just a testament to how dedicated you are. Praise the Lord. Um, so as you go today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.
Amen. You are dismissed.